means that's the kind of, turns out you can just watch it on the internet and it's almost exactly the same as driving down here from the Oakland area. Not that I'm saying you shouldn't do this every month because we would love it. Come a little early. Are we done? Like we're starting the show already? Starting soon now. Yeah. Man, I that was that was very surprising. Because normally, as you know, we do this fake talk thing. It, I'm not even gonna go into it. Look, this whole front page of things I could fake talk. No, I want to talk about toaster ovens. Uh, before I toaster ovens are they're like tiny ovens that sit on your counter uh, in your kitchen where you can bake or toast tiny things. And they have the word toaster in them uh, as if you could use them to make toast. And you can use them to make toast, but they are not good toasters. Uh, do not buy a toaster oven if your primary focus is toast. Uh, but like if you want to make brownies or cinnamon rolls or something, they are a much, much more effective way if you buy one of the cool ones now that has like a very complicated computer inside where you can say, I want you to cook for exactly 13 minutes at 375 degrees, go, and then it'll heat itself up and then it'll be like, oh look, I've reached 375 degrees, I'm gonna start baking for 13 minutes and I'm gonna turn off and then the brownies will be perfect uh, as opposed to before where if I wanted to make brownies, like I'd, I'd go into my kitchen, I'd turn my oven on to 400 degrees and um, I have to wait 20 minutes and I have to look through the window at the little thermometer I have hanging in the window and then it'll be like, oh, your oven's 350 degrees. And I'm like, no, you just told me you were 375 and it's like, no, I'm a thermometer. Trust me, it's 350 at best. And then I have to wait longer for it to get to the, buy a, to buy a complicated toaster oven, people. Uh, it'll sit in your kitchen. It'll do nice things. Mostly it'll make brownies and cinnamon rolls. Uh, like every weekend whenever you want brownies or cinnamon rolls in a very effective, delightful way. Um, see, I would have been fake talking about that, but I'm not. Um, welcome to the show. Uh, it's May 2019. Uh, we haven't taped in a couple months because I've been busy or sick or the studio was closed for holidays. I think those were the, the reasons we haven't taped before now. Uh, but now the studio's open. Uh, and I am not sick, but I am still crazy busy, but I have made time for you, my valuable followers there on Facebook and the forums. Uh, what have I done? Like Sunday, Sunday, uh, I, had to, uh, I had to tell my little watchy thingy to buzz at 545 in the morning uh, so it would wake me up so that I could then get out of bed and pull on, I put on a pair of shorts uh, and a nice... I put on a supportive pair of underwear. Uh, I think you guys can, can deal with that. Uh, and, and a shirt, uh, one of my double-click shirt had a dinosaur on it. Uh, and then over that, uh, I pulled on a pair of loungewear because uh, I was going outside and it was kind of cold, but I didn't feel like wearing like one of my thick pair of sweats because I was going to go run a half marathon. And I was like, I'm not going to run a half marathon in really thick sweats. I'll get really hot. So I'll just wear this loungewear uh, and I say loungewear, it was, of course, actually pajamas. Uh, so I left the house wearing pajamas with a pair of running shorts under them. Uh, and I couldn't find a hat. Uh, and I suntan lotion myself up. I had a little fanny pack. Because uh, when I jog, I have a fanny pack because I'm old. Uh, and I don't care what I look like anymore. I just want to have a thing to put my wallet in uh, that's not my pocket. Because uh, I put my phone in my pocket. Uh, so I got up, pulled on all my clothes, uh, drank my two cups of coffee, which I have to drink in the morning if I want to have any chance of having brain activity at all. Uh, and then I hopped in a lift. I went to downtown San Jose, and then I stood around for like 40 minutes before the half marathon started. Uh, and then midway through those 40 minutes, I convinced myself I don't want to go jogging in pajamas because I still might get hot, even though they're very thin. Uh, so I took the pajamas off, and I gave them to the gear check people. Uh, and standing in line for the gear check people took me past the start of the race. So 
everyone in the half marathon had already gone. And now it's like 8, 10 in the morning and I'm standing in downtown San Jose. And so I just started jogging. I'm not sure why I do this. I mean, that, that's the point where I was said, well, and then of course I went to jog a half marathon because that's what you do, but no, there's no reason to do it. Uh, I just did it because I wanted to see if I could do it again and I'm trying to be less fat. I don't know if jogging is helping, but it's probably not hurting because for at least two and a half hours, I wasn't eating very much. I had some water. Uh, you're jogging along the street and every once in a while, there'll just be crazy, enthusiastic young people pushing cups of water on you like it's their life's mission. Like, have some water, have some water, have some water. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to take that cup of water from you, and then I'm going to try to drink it while moving down the street. Never a good idea. Um, uh, and then sometimes they're like, it's electrolytes. And I'm like, ooh, plants love electrolytes. Uh, and then none of them laughed, which means that movie is older than they are, probably. Uh, and they haven't seen it to know why plants love electrolytes. Uh, is in fact a hilarious joke, uh, and our current reality. Uh, but leaving that aside, um, two and a half hours later, uh, I finally got to the, I'm going to say finish line. It's really the stopping line, because I didn't finish anything. I just, they were like, you've gotten there. And I'm like, good, I'm not going to run anymore. Uh, and then I stood around for an hour when my foot hurt, uh, and people gave me things. Uh, they were like, hey, put this cream on your foot. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, oh, by the way, it has weed in it. And I'm like, of course it does. It's California. It's foot cream after a marathon with weed in it. Does it do anything? And they're like, no, it's just CBD. And I'm like, darn. And then I went to the booth two over, the airfield people, who were sponsors of the race. Like, in my wildest dreams, it had never occurred to me that I'd, I'd come to a point in my life when a place that sells weed is sponsoring a half marathon. Like that, that doesn't make any sense. If you're on weed, you don't want to run at all. Which I know because after I finished the race and went home, I took some of my weed chocolate and then I did not want to move off the couch for the rest of the day. It was enjoyable, but it was not a lot of moving off the couch. Um, that was a half marathon. As I said, my foot hurt. Uh, for the thing. Uh, also, uh, before the race, like I'd been like, I gotta get my hair cut, cause it's been a while, see? Don't, don't comment in the forums, people. I will get my hair cut, uh, maybe this weekend. Um, I can tell it's too bad, cause these, this is how long my hair has grown since the last haircut, cause I just haven't chopped all of the, this is how I tell. Um, what else was going on? Just a couple weeks ago, like, like a week ago, uh, uh, I, I reached the point where I have been working at Apple for 30 years, uh, which is an accomplishment, people tell me, because the company's only been around for like 43 years. So I've been there for a lot of it. Uh, and then like, I just do like typey typey, hey, today's 30 years at Apple. And then everyone's like, congratulations, how did you manage to stay so long? And I'm like, well, there's, there's one way you stay at a company a long time. Uh, you don't leave. Like, I have a lot of friends that are like, yeah, I was at Apple for like six years. And I'm like, then what happened? They're like, well, I left. I'm like, well, there, that's why you didn't make it to 30. I mean, there's some people that, that, that got laid off and fired and other bad things happened. Uh, but primarily, like, if you leave, you're not going to make it to 30 years. Uh, and then people are like, hey, have you learned, do you have any wisdom having been there for 30 years? And I'm like, not exactly wisdom. Um, but I do now get to tell an awful lot of people I work with, hey, I've worked here every single day you've been alive. <laughs> and then their little eyes just, they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, just like picture when you were three and learning to crawl. Yeah, I was writing 68K assembly for this company then. And then, like, remember in, when you were 13 and that girl dumped you at the high school dance? Yeah, I was 
wording 68K assembly here for this company <laughs> then. A lot of 68K assembly. It was, it was great. You had registers and stuff. <sighs> destination weddings. I want to talk about destination weddings, people. Um, first of all, you know my thoughts on weddings. Um, they should just happen suddenly. No one should know about them till afterwards. And then everyone should say, yay, you got married. Uh, and then you should all drink. And then you go home. And that's it. That's... Weddings should be like single day affairs. Maybe you plan for a couple days beforehand, but primarily single day affairs. Uh, destination weddings are almost the opposite of that. Destination weddings are like, hey, everybody, we're going to send you a postcard that says, here's a date three years from now. You're going to not want to do anything that day. And I'll be like, it's three years from now. Okay, I don't know that I was planning on doing anything that day, but I guess now I will plan on doing something that day. And then time will pass, and then you will get another card in the mail that's like, hey, remember we told you, here's a thing on that date. And then I will look at my calendar and go, darn, I can't go to your wedding. I've got that blocked off for some reason. Uh, and then Loretta will tell me, no, that's the same reason. It's, they, like, save the date. Like, you just put it in a year ago when they told you to. Now this is the thing on that date. And I'm like, well, that's, that's convenient, because I normally don't have a lot of stuff a year and a half out in my calendar. So I was very surprised two people wanted to do something the same weekend in June. But OK. And then they'd be like, oh, by the way, uh, it's nowhere you can drive to. Uh, unless you want to drive for a very long time, like days, or if you have a boat. Be like, oh. um, and then you'll be like, well, I guess we can spend all of our vacation money going there. <sighs> and then eventually you'll get a card that's like, hey, we decided not to get married. Or better yet, again, we decided to elope. Screw that save the date thing. Uh, by the way, will you send us a gift? And I'll send you a toaster oven. Uh, now, all of that said, uh, I have a friend that's, that, has, that has sent me the, hey, save the date. They put a magnet on the fridge. And then they were like, hey, we're getting married. And I'm like, yeah, I know. You sent me a save the date thing. No one saves a date for anything but marriages. It's not like, hey, save the date, June 2022. Uncle Bob's going to die. No, it doesn't happen. Uh, it's always weddings. Uh, someone's like, hey, we're getting married. And I'm like, sure, we'll come. We like you. Like, well, it's at Disneyland. And I'm like, whoa, that's, that's practically a vacation spot. Are you getting married in Disneyland? They're like, no, that's very expensive. I'm like, good. We're getting married near Disneyland. Then we're going to go to Disneyland. Perfect, people. Perfect. If you're going to do a destination wedding, the wedding should be like 18 minutes long. Uh, again, there's three parts to a wedding. Uh, there's, hi, everyone, thanks for coming. A1 object, sit down. Uh, we're getting married. You want to marry him? You want to marry her? You're married. Go home or go to a place and drink and eat. But leave here. You got to leave here. We've only given you 18 minutes, and you've used 16 of them. Uh, Disneyland, it'll be a fun thing. Uh, and then we're going to go to Disneyland afterwards, I think, I hope. Um, and that whole Star Wars thing will be open, uh, which to me I think is great because I think the rest of the park will be emptier. I'm not going to try and get anywhere near that Star Wars thing because it's like a month after it opens. It's going to be packed with people, uh, so maybe we'll be able to see the Haunted Mansion thing. <sighs> the next card is uh, movies about dogs. Um, been watching TV lately, and every once in a while, this commercial will come on. It's like, hey, we've got a movie about a dog, and then I have to mute the TV and hit pause on my DVR, and then wait like a minute, and then hit skip 30 seconds, skip 30 seconds, unmute, because I don't want to see commercials about movies about dogs, because there's, there's zero movies about dogs that don't make me feel sad, really sad, even the trailers, even the, the short 45 second trailers for a movie about a dog 
just makes me sad for the rest of the day. Um, like I, we were talking before the show, I was trying to think of a dog movie that wasn't sad. It was like Old Yeller, sad. Uh, Lassie, Lassie was a TV show, but someone was like, you know, Lassie died in one of the movies. I'm like, what? That would just make me very, very... There were Benji movies. I don't, what, I don't remember what Benji did in the Benji movies, but I assume it was sad. Uh, there was that book about the, the, the sports writer that had the dog that died. It's just, geez, people, stop making movies about dogs that make me unhappy. So I was like, hey, what about that, that pet movie? That wasn't sad. That was a comedy. And I'm like, well, yeah, it was, it was pets. It wasn't just a dog. It was, all, it was just all animals. It was like, it's like you replaced all the actors with cartoon animals and you made a comedy. That's not a dog movie. That's a comedy with animals. Like one of them fence movies with the hedgehogs or something. And then after all that, I did finally think of a dog movie that I remember enjoying. Uh, when I was young, there was a Disney movie called The Shaggy D.A., uh, where a district attorney got turned into a dog. And I think he still had to be a district attorney. I don't remember any of the details. I just remember as a child, it was the Shaggy Da. And my mother was like, no, it's the Shaggy D.A. And I'm like, it's the same, it's Da. She's like, no, district attorney. And then I learned what a district attorney was, people. So they're educational. There's one movie about a dog that's educational that doesn't make me sad. Likewise, like movies about cats, I'm trying to think of a sad movie about a cat. And Lion, there's that movie about the lion that's kind of sad, but lions aren't cats, they're just big cat-like things that could murder you. I guess regular cats could murder you, it would just take longer. Like, I'm pretty sure my cat wanted to murder me a whole bunch, because I'd just be sitting on the couch and I'd look over at him and he'd be... Be like, you're thinking of murdering me, aren't you? And then he'd just nod very slowly and silently. I'd be like, you're not going to do it, though, are you? And he'd be like... <laughs> but sometimes he'd be like... Yeah, yeah, that cat. That cat would have murdered me if, if Loretta hadn't put her foot down. And then, like, no murdering. Uh, okay. Uh, we went to San Francisco uh, a couple weeks ago, and we saw a musical uh, called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, apparently, they have run out of ideas to make musicals about. Or not run out, but they're running low. So they have started to look backwards to say, hey, what could we make a musical about? Like in the old days, uh, before all of the uh, good ideas were done, uh, like three guys would be in a room, and they'd be like, hey, let's make a musical. Uh, and then the second guy would go, what should we make the musical about? And then the third guy would go, how about pirates? And the first guy would go, great, everyone loves pirates. And the second guy would go, no, no, a lot of, no, pirates were technically very, very bad. Like, no one actually loves pirates. And then, like, the third guy would go, we can fix that. Uh, and then they would go down and they would buy some bagels uh, and they would come back up uh, and then the second guy would sit at a piano and he would like hit four keys and that would be a melody that hadn't been made before because again they haven't made a lot of music yet so if you just hit five notes in a row odds are it's music uh, and then the first guy would go like I can think of some words and then he'd write the words down, and then the music guy would tap on the keys some more, and then the third guy would leave. He would go find a rich guy uh, who had made all of his money on oil and wanted to spend some of it to uh, make the country better, slash get a big tax deduction in some way, slash not look like a terrible person for having driven countless people to destitution. And he'd be like, hey, here's some money. Go make me a musical. Um, then they would typey, typey, typey on the old uh, typewriter, and clicky, clicky, clicky on the keyboard, on the, on the musical keyboard, uh, and then you'd get like the Pirates of Penzance, 
uh, which I believe is a musical, uh, and it might even be about pirates. Uh, I do think it has a general in it, uh, and a lot of British people. Uh, musicals used to have British people in them. Almost all musicals were British. Um, but again, all of those stories have been done uh, these days. So now they're like, well, we need to make a musical. Uh, how about Encyclopedia Brown? Has anyone done an Encyclopedia Brown musical? And then they'll go to Google, and they'll go Encyclopedia Brown musical. Uh, and then it'll be like, well, yeah, that's seven kids in Iowa made an Encyclopedia Brown musical in 2009. So, like, call those kids. We're going to pay them for their musical. Um, and then they'll... It'll be a terrible musical, uh, is what I'm saying. Uh, and in this case, like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, there was a British guy. It's always a British guy uh, who, like, was a spy. And then after he was a spy, he got home and was like, well, I'm going to write some books for kids because spy stuff. And then he wrote a bunch of books for kids. One of them was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The other one, I think, involved a peach. There's just, it's just rife with sexual undercurrents, near as I can tell. Um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, in the book, there's a, a little British waif and his mother living in what I'm going to say is terrible, terrible poverty uh, as part of a very dysfunctional family. Uh, and nearby is a megalomaniac billionaire uh, who just wants to screw with people. Uh, and so he sets up like a death lottery. Uh, and gets a, a bunch of people to just send their children to him. Uh, and then horrible things happen uh, while a tribe of enslaved tiny people look on uh, and laugh. Uh, and in the end, we're supposed to feel happy uh, because the one non-bad person in this entire story inherits a chocolate factory. Uh, and becomes a billionaire, uh, and then I assume his children, if he eventually had them, would be like the Kardashians. So the cycle is just going to repeat eventually. Um, that was a book. I remember reading it as a child, uh, and it was a it was an enjoyable book. Uh, and then apparently, as an adult, someone was like, "Well, let's make a musical out of this book." How many songs do we know that involve candy? It's like, well, there's that, there's that Candyman song. It's got candy in the title. And they're like, good, we'll open with that. How many other songs do we know that involve candy? And they're like, well, there's that one from the 70s, but it's just full of sexual undercurrents. And they're like, no, we can't use that one. I guess we'll have to write a bunch of new songs for our candy musical. And they wrote a bunch of new songs, and they updated it all so that, like, the, you know, the character that was kind of stuck on herself becomes someone that loves to take selfies with her phone, because that's hip. And, like, 20 years from now, they'll be like, selfies with your phone? That's, that's what our parents did. <sighs> anyway, we went and saw this musical. Uh, it, was, it was okay. It wasn't great. It wasn't terrible. Uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Now, the funny thing is, I remember they made a sequel to the book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I think it was Charlie and the Glass Elevator. Although, I think the Glass Elevator was in the first book. So, this was kind of a, I need a sequel. It's got to pick up where the last book left off. The last book left off in a glass elevator. The whole second book was probably just entirely set in a glass elevator. It's like the book equivalent of that uh, Seinfeld show where they were just waiting in the lobby of the Chinese restaurant. Entire second book set in the glass elevator. Um, I don't have a lot of time left. Um, okay, I went on Nerd Boat. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I, go on a, I go on a cruise every year. It's a boat full of nerds. It's a great time. Uh, you, you should go on Nerd Boat, but you have to buy tickets soon because it's about to sell out again. Like last year, Nerd Boat sold out before the previous year's Nerd Boat had even sailed. Um, this year's Nerd Boat didn't sell out before it sailed, but it's like mostly full, and they made the boat bigger, so it's probably the 
very enjoyable. Uh, Nerdboat.com will get you there. Um, nominally, there, these musicians, there's lots of stuff. Go there. Just search the web. You'll find it. Um, this last year, we did some some diff we did some very enjoyable things on Nerdboat. Uh, we went to Puerto Rico. Uh, and while we were in Puerto Rico, we went to the Bacardi factory where they make rum. I was like, Bacardi, they make rum. We should go there. And Loretta was like, hell yeah. <laughs> and then we get to the Bacardi factory. Uh, and we took a tour of the Bacardi factory. Uh, and they were like, welcome to the Bacardi factory. This is where we make Bacardi. And I was like, well, sure. And they're like, no, this is where we make almost all the Bacardi in the world is made here. And I was like, oh. they're like, all of those buildings are full of rum. And I was like, I am, this is my happy place. And then they're like, here's how we make rum. And I was like, I'm you people are God's gift to humanity. That's all I'm saying. Just thank you. Thank you for what you do. And they were like, would you like to taste rum? And I'm like, that is why we came. I mean, it's, it's nice to see the buildings, but hand over the rum. And then they were like, here's the first rum. And I was like, yeah, that's rum. And they're like, yeah, that's our worst rum. And I'm like, again, God. Just. And then they... They just kept giving us rum, and every rum was better. And then they get they like, here's the last rum. It's our special reserve rum. And I was like, that's very, very good rum. I'm like, you can buy this rum. And I'm like, I'm already, I've already decided I'm buying this rum. How much is it? And I'm like, well, it's $160 a bottle. And I'm like, well, I'm buying that rum is what I'm buying. I'm, <laughs> I'm buying more than one bottle of that rum is what I'm saying. It's bought the rum, people. Uh, there's one minute left. Uh, what else? On the boat... Um, as you know, I buy the drinks package on the boat, uh, not because I don't know if it's better or worse, uh, but I enjoy just being able to say, give me that drink. And if it's bad, I don't drink it. And if it's good, I drink a lot of it. This year, I decided to try every single whiskey they had on the boat. And they had a long list of whiskeys. So I just started at the top. I was like, give me this whiskey. And then they would. And then I would work my way down. There were a lot of good whiskeys on that boat. Um, some of them, I might have had more whiskey than you should have had before you are tasting another whiskey, but it still worked out, people. Um, also, they had, uh, as I said, it's a boat full of nerds. Um, <coughs> some nerds, like, you want to be, you want to you wanna help nerds get along. So they were like, we need people who are good at talking to people, and we'll give them sashes. And then they'll walk around and ensure conversation happens. And that's what I, and I signed up to do this. Uh, and they were like, hey, go ahead. Here's your sash. And I'm like, I'm going to be drinking. They're like, that's fine. The time's up. I know the time is up. I'm supposed to, like, credits are rolling, people. Credits are rolling. <laughs> really want.